from back there, right? Uh, what Camtasia is going to do is it's going to do a screencast of everything on my screen and then obviously record through this microphone. So th those will look a little bit different. Uh, before we start, there's one preparation step I want you guys to do. Again, go to my page. Or, where is it? Uh, why is this acting so weird? Can you guys get to it? Mypage.iu.edu? It's just not showing up on mine. That's weird. Oh, I see it. That was the projector. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so at the very bottom there, it says week three. So a couple things I want you to... Uh, just download all those links. So stimulus directory, proc script, and decom underscore im dot sh. Okay? We probably actually won't use the proc script. You can avoid that. But stimulus directory and decom im. Okay? So if you download stimulus directory, it's mydir.tgz. You can unzip that. And it'll give you this folder called stimuli. So this just has all the different timing files we'll be using for this demonstration. Okay, everybody see that so far? All right, so what I want you guys to do is first download stimuli, down, download uh, decon underscore im. Those should be in your download folder, okay? Has anybody not downloaded FSL example data, the thing that we'll be using for today? Yeah, okay. Ah, that's fine, sorry. Yeah, anybody not have it? Okay, so wherever that directory is, move the stimulus folder, this, uh, which for me is in downloads. If you wanna know what you just downloaded most recently, there's a really useful command, ls-lrt, which gives you everything in reverse chronological order. So the latest thing that you downloaded. So this stimuli folder and also uh, decon im.sh. So move both of those two things from download. So the stimuli folder and also decon underscore im to uh, wherever your FSL example data folder is. Yeah? Download stimuli. How do you move a folder? Yeah, whatever. But wherever it is, just make sure that you can put it within that directory, okay? You can use Finder if you need to. Uh, mine's already in there. Okay, so are we all there so far? What's that? I think it's just MV. Is it MV? Because Yeah, for some reason it's... Oh, no, never mind. Yeah, I already have the directory in there, so that's why. Yeah, that's what Wait, seriously, that happened? Oh, my God. All right. I remember that. Okay. So we're all good? We all got the stuff in there so far? Okay, so to prepare this for what we're going to be doing today, which is this beta series analysis, so we have this running in the background before I give the, the brief lecture overview. Open up ubersubject.py. This little rocket ship will open up. SI subject ID, I'll just call this SO1, and group ID will call this beta series. <coughs> this is what the, it'll call the different folders. Initialization, that's fine. You don't need to change any of the defaults. Anatomical data set <coughs> is going to be within fMRI raw data. And within here, we have all the, the DICOM files, and also a lot of these were converted into nifty format. So the anatomical is S007A1001. Okay, if you have uber subject that py open. So select that. Go to epi data sets. Browse epi. And again, the same folder, just to keep things short and simple, we're just gonna be analyzing one run. So select S005A001. Lastly, stimulus timing files. If you go back to wherever you put the stimuli, uh, just select all of these. 
a little bit of background on this experiment. This was back when I was in graduate school, a long time ago. <laughs> and we had a device that we want to use inside the scanner. It was a nicotine administration device. We want to know whether it would induce any artifacts if somebody was being scanned doing whatever. So. While smoking. What? While smoking. Yeah, while smoking, while doing the little tasks that they were doing. So to pilot this, I, I went in there and just like put this thing next to my head to see if anything would happen, you know. So things like holding your breath, then breathing, tapping left and tapping right, really simple stuff just to see whether the data looked okay. So that's why it looks the way it does. <clears throat> okay. So only four conditions, just one run, pretty simple. <clears throat> All the defaults are fine, nothing to change here. And the only thing I am going to change is just to save time. Under extra regress options, turn off cl cluster simulation. I'm not interested in that. And also extra line options, select uh, use giant move. Okay. Once you have all that, click this button right here that outputs the AFNI proc the py script. Uh, this one actually runs that script to create the entire Unix script and then the green button actually runs the whole thing. So that'll take maybe five minutes, 10 minutes in the background. Just make sure it's running, make sure there are no errors so far, and I'll start with the lecture, okay? All right, okay, we're on there. Okay, again, pretty short lecture today. A lot of this is gonna be review. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting over a little bit of a cold, so I shouldn't be talking that long. Uh, <clears throat> the first two lectures we talked about were different types of connectivity, right? So the first one was what we call resting state functional connectivity. A pretty simple idea where we just had a voxel or a set of voxels, and we want to know whether one of these reference voxels or clusters correlated with other voxels in the brain or anti-correlated with them as well. Either one's interesting, and what you could do is you could set seeds in certain regions which were known to activate these different hubs or different related clusters of voxels called networks, right? It's like the default mode network. What are some other ones? It's like the visual network, the hearing network, the reading network has also been claimed. <coughs> a lot of different networks, and they're discovering more all the time. So the idea there was, does one of these things correlate with this other voxel in the brain? Okay. Under conditions of rest, we're not modeling anything that the participants are actually doing. The only thing that we model in that case are sources of noise, like motion, uh, physiological artifacts, like heartbeat, respiration, if you can measure those things. And then we performed the connectivity analysis on everything that was left over. Essentially, what in a typical task-related data set would be called the error time series, everything that is not being modeled, right? That was resting state connectivity. We followed this up with psychophysiological interactions, which was asking, okay, so does one of these uh, voxels correlate with another voxel, but only under certain conditions? So in other words, you'd be asking whether under condition A, does the correlation between two different sets of voxels increase or decrease significantly, depending whether they're on that, in that condition or not, right? So slightly more interesting. Again, when we call these things connectivity, you gotta take that with a grain of salt because we're not talking about connectivity in the normal sense of the word. These are really just fluctuations that co-occur. It's really just correlation analyses, and we're applying different fancy spins to them. Right? Uh, you know, when people t think about real connectivity, it's like where the actual structural connectivity between different regions. And you can do things like DTI, you can do this to constrain things like a dynamic causal model, which gives you more directionality, which can be more powerful in explaining things. All right, so this last variation on connectivity we want to talk about is something called beta series analysis. Okay, conceptually, it's the exact same thing as what we talked about with functional connectivity. But this time, it's like you can apply functional connectivity to a task-related data set, which is more useful because most of the data set that we collect are involved in some kind of task where people are actually doing something, right? Or there are different stages of a task. For example, uh, this is from the Rispin paper where you might have, say, a queue for a working memory task and a delay, and then the actual probe where you need to recall something. So three different stages for each trial. 
<clears throat> what you have in beta series analysis is instead of like with the, the typical GLM where you'd estimate one beta per condition, right? So for example, if we wanted to look at the overall average beta for Q, right? That's what we typically model. Also the average for delay, the average for probe condition. Yeah. And then for each subject you get one beta and then you take those to a second level and you run a second level t-test on it. With beta series analysis, it assumes that the trial by trial variation in these parameter estimates is meaningful. And that if there are systematic correlations in these beta estimates going up or down, that can also give you some idea of what different regions are functionally connected during task conditions. So same concept of structural connectivity, but now instead of just correlating the raw time series like we would in a resting state analysis, we're correlating these different peaks, right? Daisy chaining these different parameter estimates together to create this new time series, a time series of beta uh, estimates. That's why it's called a beta series correlation, right? <clears throat> so you'll notice, I mean, on, on average, the Q is roughly larger than, say, the delay phase. And if you just average across all those, like you would in a typical event-related design, that would give you like a typical beta estimate. You could contrast those two, and you'd get that the Q is greater on average than the delay period. But you also notice that with these trial and this little schematic, there are systematic changes in the variability. Right? If you took each of these, if say you took a value for the Q condition of say 0.5 for the first trial and 0.7 for the second trial and about 0.6 for the third trial, and you took that and you tried to correlate that series with every other box on the brain, you could see what other regions systematically fluctuate with that. Make sense so far? It's the whole idea behind beta series analysis. Again, not a very complicated thing to do, but it can answer some new questions for you if you wanted to. Now, here's why it's useful. <clears throat> Typically, when people carry out univariate analysis, like I mentioned, you're contrasting basically the average across all the uh, events of that condition in your experiment. Right? You collapse across that, and you compare that to the average of another condition in your experiment. That's a typical univariate analysis. So for a simple experiment like where you have, in this case, uh, this is a motor task experiment where there's either interleave tapping left and right, or you do like a series of right taps followed by a series of left taps. A univariate analysis of each of those two would show some kind of motor activity, right? Uh, an older version of functional connectivity called coherence analysis kind of shows the same thing. If in that cyan region you use that as one of your ROIs, seed region. You try to see where the activity in that region correlates with other parts in the brain. <clears throat> in panel C, this is all from the Rissman paper, a 2004 paper. The correlation is basically if you try to apply that functional connectivity analysis that we talked about, except in the task setting. Right? So again, like some issues with that is that you know, with those functional connectivity analyses, you may not be modeling uh, all the sources of, say, uh, variants that you could. Or even if you do, it may soak up so much that what's left over could be meaningless. Right? Depends how you model it. But with a beta series correlation analysis in panel D, you get, in each of these two Cs there, pretty uh, interesting maps that show more than either the coherence or the correlation analysis. Okay, so that was their rough schematic for why that might be interesting. Now, another reason why this might be interesting is because these correlation analyses can give you more information that a univariate analysis may not give you, right? So you carry out a univariate analysis, you can see some contrast between different conditions, but these correlation analyses can give you maybe some more information about other regions that are correlated with it, but not necessarily also significant in a univariate analysis. So you see in this case, in say the Q and the pro phase of that working memory task they're talking about, just think of like a, a really standard working memory task. You see activity uh, in both the Q and the probe phase, right? Not a whole lot in the delay. It's usually more active in the probe. But if you use a, a seed, say in the fusiform phase area during this 
task for whatever reason, you would notice that in the delay condition, there's actually very significant correlation in the beta series for, say, the posterior parietal region and the FFA. So it gives you some more information. Again, the interpretation is up to you. Now, the beta series steps, not a whole lot that you have to do. There's no difference in pre-processing that you would have to do compared to that and a typical task oriented design, right? So smoothing, registration, motion correction, all of that stuff is exactly the same, as far as I can tell. The only thing that's going to change, again, like in all these connectivity analyses, is going to be in setting up the model. And really, the more that you work with these and the more that you play around with these, the better sense you'll have of what goes on here, how that maps onto the results that you see after you've done everything. Right? The only thing that we're changing here is in red. And in AFNI, all we change is this IM option. So stim times, usually that just means, OK, I'm going to give you a series of timings that show you every time that this condition happened, every event of this condition. And in a typical task weighted analysis, it'll take the best average parameter estimate it can for each of those conditions. And then you can contrast them or take those beta waves to a second level analysis. This IM option, this stands for individual modulation or individually modulated. What this means is output a separate beta estimate for each occurrence of that condition. So if you had, say, eight occurrences of the breathe condition, you're going to be getting eight beta weights for the breathe condition. Make sense? Each one of those is going to be a single number. Then you can extract those from an ROI and then perform a correlation analysis on that. Um, I forgot my handouts. Shoot. Well, I'll see if I need them. Okay. Everything else, things like motion, that's pretty standard, so I just leave that in. <clears throat> okay. So let's take a look at what this looks like. And if you've been running it, it should be done by about now. Let's check on that, make sure it's okay. Um, what should have happened, if we go into subject results, SO1, just keep spidering down until you get to the very uh, last directory. If we open this up, um, let's see here. What you should see is if you overlay the statistics on top of this on with skull warped, you will see the typical univariate analysis. So this first deconvolution we did is what you do for a typical task weighted analysis. So for example, you'd have coefficients and t-stats for each of the conditions. I also output the f-stats. So I have three different parameters for each of these different conditions, okay? Basically the average across both of them if you look at just the coefficients. So nothing too interesting there. If I look at something like uh, tab left and I overlay the T statistic, I'm going to threshold this just so you can see it a little bit better. Let's see, make sure that looks good. So what you should see if they're tapping left is in the right motor cortex, obviously there's going to be a lot more activity, right? So this is just a typical, very simple, low level analysis. All right, so the next thing I want you guys to do is copy that, uh, what, is, what was it called, decon underscore im dot sh. <clears throat> copy that to this directory and then run it. Oh, before you do, sorry, don't be too quick. Uh, just take a look at the design matrix right here. So notice in a typical acne design matrix, for example, in this case, there's these first four columns are, are polynomials, regressing out trends, like linear, quadratic, uh, cubic, whatever you have there. And then you have one regressor for each of your conditions, right? And in this case, for the first regressor, say there are four conditions, or sorry, four events of, say, breathing, uh, four events for the other condition, and then say uh, another four for the other conditions as well, right? And then our motion parameters. What's going to happen in a beta series analysis is instead of just having four regressors, each one of these different occurrences is going to get its own separate uh, regressor. Yeah. 
So if you go ahead and run the decon underscore im, again, this will just take a few seconds uh, while it's running. Notice that at the very beginning said, you know, this regressor right here is actually going to have four regressors. This one's going to have four. Next one's going to have eight. So if you actually look at those timing files, this first one would have four timings, then four timings, then eight timings, eight timings. And you'll see that reflected in the design matrix once this is done. Any questions so far? Hey, did I notice you have your view set on neurological? Is that correct? Or is it I, I think I have mine in radiological. It's kind of weird. What's on the left is on the left, but it's saying that uh, it's positive as it moves from right to left. So on the left side, it's going to have a, a positive uh, number associated with it in the x direction. Yeah, it's trying to match up the yeah right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. But that was actually the right motor cortex. Right. It was on the right hand side of the Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay, so again, take a look at this. Uh, basically, it's overwritten all the different stats, data sets that we put in there under AIV x.jpg. And now you'll see that each of these has been broken into different regressors right here, right? So first, you know, what we had before was these first four regressors here were actually collapsed into one regressor in that previous matrix. And that's like the same for the second set of four. And then there was a set of eight, set of eight. So essentially we've just taken all of the instances of whatever happened and then multiplied it by the uh, number of regressors that we had. Yeah? Okay. So the second part of this is actually going to be extracting it. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, Jeff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one of them happens to fall, and where one of those trials are. Right. Um, how do you deal with that um, column in the design matrix being um, different, essentially? Yeah. Um, so the question was if you have, if something's been censored out for motion or whatever reason, how do you account for it? Um, one thing you could do if you want is to, uh, I believe there's an option in 3DD Conval called All Zero OK where we'll still make an attempt to estimate it anyway. Yeah, that, that's what we've been yeah. I'm not sure what the recommended practice is, to be honest. Um, it doesn't make a huge change if, say, one of those betas is uh, removed. I mean, how big of an issue is it if, say, one of them just was censored out for whatever reason? Well, it won't run. Yeah. Oh, it just won't run. Okay. Yeah, 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 then that's what I would do, is just use the all zero uh, okay option. Is there also yeah. a way of uh, like allowing that trial to, you know, not necessarily censoring it from the design matrix, it's allowing it to, um, like later on, you can then remove those. Um, sort of like yeah, yeah. the information about which one of them later uh -huh. decides from. Right. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the best practice is for that, to be honest. Uh, all I know that if you do want to run, you'd have to use one of the built-in workarounds in 3D Deep Convolve. Um, yeah. Okay. So the next thing is to actually create some kind of seed region or ROI that we won't extract these betas from, right? Let's see here. So what we can do is if we wanted to create a mask either based on like an anatomical region or it could be based on say a uh, some kind of you know functional contrast, right? Let me see here. I'm actually going to modify this slightly. What 
What I think I'm going to do is I'm going to create a contrast of left minus right in the univariate condition and use that as a mask to extract our betas for, say, the tap left condition. So, GLT sim. Anybody here use VI editor? No? Oh, man. I feel old. Let's see here. Right. It's uh, not efficient, but it's how I was raised. So I'm not going to change. Oh my gosh. Okay. Use a one. All right. Should have brought my handouts. Bad Andy. Okay. So the reason I'm going through all this is because, again, like, you can define your ROIs however you want. Um, in this case, what I'm going to try to show is that if we take a look at the typical contrast of right minus left, for example, or left minus right is what I'm doing. You take that look at that univariate analysis where it's significant, and you compare that to this beta series analysis, where you extract betas from that same ROI, you'll be seeing a slightly different pattern, which could give you potentially more information. Okay, and here's the way that I'm gonna do it. Again, this is a useful tool to have if you wanna create ROIs based on a functional contrast. <coughs> so under stats, scan, I'm going to go to tap left minus tap right. Threshold that. Let's, uh, let's make it something even Anders Eklund can't criticize. 0.001. Let's say 150. Wonder how that guy's doing, by the way. You ever wonder what happens? Guys like that, kind of like one hit wonders. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe maybe he'll have a good career. I don't know. I just remember, like, back when I was first starting out, there were, like, some you know, landmark papers, and then I never heard from those people again. It's interesting when you think about it. All right. Well, Biswell was one. Biswell, yeah, yeah. It started out as what could have just been one hit wonder. That's true, some yeah. Cool yeah, some people really continue on. So we'll see. Okay, so basically what I've done here is thresholded it so that I only have that particular cluster, and then I'm going to save that out as a mask. All right, so here's how I'm defining my ROI. Again, see what I just created. Uh, make this something a little bit more informative. So instead of plus, let's say tap left minus tap right uh, mask. Okay. And then from here, we're going to be extracting a series of beta weights. And the way I'm going to do this, just follow with me here, is if I look at stats.so1. Remember, this is from my most recent analysis where <coughs> I did the individual modulation, right? So I have one beta for each particular trial. And if I look at that, 3D info verb, let's see, if I scroll up a little bit. Okay, so let's say I'm interested in only the betas for the tap left condition for whatever reason. This, you know, I have no strong hypothesis. This is a very simple data set for educational purposes. But the only betas I would want, these are represented by this COF, right? So subricks 17, <coughs> 19, 21, 23, all the way up until 31 are the betas that I'm interested in. These are the betas I want to extract and put into a beta series daisy chain. The way to do this is through a 3D bucket. I'm going to call this prefix tap left betas. And I'm going to extract from stats.so1 
quotation and then 17 dot dot 31 in parentheses two to signify that I'm going to be selecting every other sub brick. Go ahead, do that. Look at what I just created, tap left betas. Oops. And scroll up to what's actually in there. So notice it extracted tap left a one co f, tap left one co f, two co f, all only the tap tap left betas are in there. Okay, so that's my whole brain beta series uh, map that I've created. And so I can extract from a, a certain region or ROI just for the betas from that. So to do that, extract those 3D mask av, uh, quiet. The mask is gonna be that, what I call it, tap left mask. Tap left minus tap right mask. And then I'm gonna extract from that anything in the underlying tap left betas um, data set. I'll call this tap left beta series file that 1D and then take a look at it with 1D pop plot. Let's take a look beta series file. Okay, so notice this looks like a very, very abbreviated, truncated time course. These are simply the betas. So. In this subject, the first beta for tap left was about 1.6. Let's see if I can expand this. 1.6, the second one was about 0.3, and 1.1, and so on. So what I'm going to do is, just like we did with the functional connectivity analysis, use this as an ideal file and cross-correlate it with every other voxel in the brain. Yeah. The command for that is going to be 3 dfam plus and we're going to be giving it first the input is tap left beta okay what did I call all these tap left betas so 3d fm plus the input's going to be tap left betas um, let's see the ideal file is going to be that beta series correlation that I extracted What else does this thing need? The output's gonna be correlation. Just want a correlation map. And then let's make this uh, my beta series. Tap left. Cool. Okay. All right. What happened here? One second, tap. Oh, Th this makes absolutely no sense, but what you have to do for, I, I don't know how I found this out, but you have to refit it with a TR of two seconds, at least in this case, for the underlying tap left betas uh, file. I, f I forget why that is or why I figured that out, but yeah, that's essentially what it does. So that outputs a correlation map. If we take a look at this, remember for the, uh, the univariate analysis, it was pretty much just the uh, right motor cortex that was getting activated, right? In this case, we wanna know if there are any significant correlations between that and other parts of the brain based on these beta series. So if I look at my beta series, tap left correlation, <laughs> Here's what the map looks like, and I'll threshold it a little bit to get rid of some of this noise. Let's say correlations of uh, 0.75 or more. Pretty healthy. So a 50. And so notice, not only within the right motor cortex, but you get a lot in the posterior parietal cortex as well. So make of that what you will, but that suggests that you know there's something else also going on between these betas. And one of the key assumptions of beta series analysis is that this variation, this trial by trial variation is somehow meaningful and means that these different regions are interacting somehow. Again, this is really up to your design. What kind of hypotheses you have about why these regions might be talking to each other or communicating at some kind of level if you look at trial by trial variability. Why might that be happening? I mean, I don't know, but this is how you do it. Now, the other steps 
which I'm not going to go into on my machine, but which we did for functional connectivity, is if you want to actually do a group level analysis, you would then convert this to a Z map, right? <clears throat> Using the RCANH uh, transformation. And um, there are a couple different ways you can do that. Uh, I believe with 3D Calc, there's the A10H. Uh, it's like a built in mathematical function. So you can go ahead and do that. If one of your, if you're, let's say that you're comparing two uh, beta series maps, like you want to see whether the correlations between two beta series is significantly different, you could just take a simple contrast between them. That's also a viable option. Okay. Then you take those transform Z scores, submit to a second level analysis, and that would be your beta series analysis. Yeah? Oh, in a neat little nutshell. <clears throat> all right, so we covered all that. Uh, just a few limitations to wrap this up here. So one, as with PPI, as with functional connectivity, there's no directionality in a beta series correlation. So don't make any inferences about that. It's not constrained. That's not something that you can tell from just running one GLM. Another limitation, or maybe it's not, depends how much hard drive space you have, is that these GLMs are gigantic because then you get one uh, parameter estimate for every single trial in your experiment. And you also have large amounts of space taken up in your hard drive. <clears throat> so even though a typical fMRI data set has a lot of degrees of freedom, right, on a single subject level, it's, it's equal to the number of time points, right? So you have a lot. Uh, minus one. Minus one, yeah. <laughs> As if that matters, we have hundreds and hundreds. But, I mean, will that, will that ever be an issue? Yeah, you can burn through a lot of degrees of freedom. Um, mm, the only example I can think of, there was a time where I ran an eye tracking study inside the scanner where every fixation um, in one of our models was actually modeled, right? Which is kind of crazy. So these were happening on a sub-TR level. <coughs> And if you, did, if you tried to do something like that, you would run out of degrees of freedom. I'm not even sure if that would be meaningful to do a beta series on that. Um, but just keep that in mind. And then, was so, that it? So let's say you have a thousand images maybe in a long list yeah. of Yeah. And maybe you have eight conditions of four trials. Is that good stuff? So or there's 400 degrees of freedom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm not sure how it would affect. Your beta S. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right, that's yeah. The, that's the yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Yeah, another thing you would notice, um, you can try this on your own uh, as an exercise. If you look at each individual uh, beta's value at a given voxel, and you compare that to if you just ran the task weighted analysis where you took the average, basically, the numbers would be pretty close in that voxel if you took the average of all the betas, and then in your just typical task weighted analysis, uh, they'd be very similar. They wouldn't be identical, though, suggesting that if you try to model each part of it individually, maybe you lose you know, a little bit of power or I mean, who knows. But they should be, in general, roughly the same, but not identical. So the reason why you, know, you might want to use this essentially as a functional connectivity for your task weighted designs is that uh, again, it can give you some more information that a typical univariate analysis might not. If you think about it, it kind of makes sense because you can have, uh, like in this figure up here, I go from here. Well, let's say that in the delay phase or the Q phase, any of these phases, they weren't all positive, but some were, you know, negative a little bit, or some were positive a little bit, right? 
That could be a, a situation where you might not get anything really in the univariate analysis, but the beta series, you could still find voxels which are very highly correlated. That's totally reasonable. As you, as you saw, when we just took a pretty you know, unexciting data set with just motor activity, right? And then we ran the, the beta series analysis. Instead of just getting motor activity, even at you know, closer corrected level, these correlation maps were showing pretty significant activation in one or two regions which are outside of the motor areas. You know, how are they connected? What's going on there? I don't know. But it's still interesting. It suggests that there's more information inside a typical data set than maybe we give it credit for. So I hope that's useful for you to use. Uh, this wraps up these three basic functional connectivity measures that uh, I just want you to all have in your toolbox. In AFNI, doing this is actually quite easy, doing this individual beta modulation. For something like uh, SPM, you have to do it, you have to script it pretty heavily to make sure it's estimating everything individually. It's not trivial. If you want the script, I have one I made a year or two ago up in my, on my blog. Um, that was mainly just made for me, but if you guys want to try it out yourself, if you use SPM, go ahead and use it. But for AFNI, it's very beta series friendly. And Jeff, you've been using this analysis in AFNI quite a bit, right? Is there anything you'd like to add from your experience about it that I may not have covered? Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, then Whereas it... Whereas we're doing analyses where we're actually taking the beta series and looking at variability across it um, for its own sort of measure activity, we need to be very sensitive to extremes. Okay. Um, we're, we're, you know, we're worried about the ABC value. Um, so that would be one thing just to kind of watch out for, I, I think, is um, kind of like to read and whether various strategies and pre-processing might help mm -hmm. from what I've seen so far. Like de-spiking? Um, yeah, exactly. Okay. That kind um, did, did you try that? Did that help? I did, and there are still some <coughs> there, so okay. um, I, I don't know how much that, that helps. Um, okay. All right. I'm, I'm going to summarize a little bit what you said just for the audio. So the, the, one of the issues that Jeff brought up was that there can be some instability in the beta estimates. You can see huge spikes in either direction on some of the trials. And like, what do you do with that? Like, do you censor them? Do you try to remove them somehow? Um, you know, I, I don't know if anybody's put anything on the message board about any of that. I haven't seen it in any of the data that I've used for beta analysis, but I've definitely had times where, like in a typical ROI analysis for task design, sometimes you get like extreme outliers for whatever reason, like one or two subjects with a beta value of 10 or something. Everyone's like between negative one and one. It's like, why does it happen? I still don't know. But um, yeah, you would hope that if these variations are systematic, then it, there should be some kind of canceling out. Like if it's really high for that particular beta, it should be high for across all the different voxels, or at least yeah. like yeah. inequality of yeah. instability. Yeah. yeah. But Right. It's like, I mean, it's oh, like, it, it, okay. It's like, it's yeah. Like, you know, when we, when we just have one session, it, <coughs> Excuse me. It, it's, not, it's not long enough to, to average out these big numbers. Mm -hmm. it, you guys did some scouring on the message boards, too. Yeah, yeah, we didn't. I didn't find anything. No, I don't know. Really we didn't touch. Okay. We had to come up with our own methods. Yeah. So, have you been doing some kind of like de spiking or filtering? That's pretty yeah. much it? Yeah, exactly. It was like one little intuition that finally you, you guys helped me see about why these could occur in, in these models. They get ultra sensitive sometimes, like the beta yeah. is really sensitive because you've got one predictor that's like this, and then the next trial has a different predictor that's you know, like this. 
and they're really close. So mm -hmm. there's not there's not very much that's distinct between those two. Like like this little part is all that that trial gets to, to grab for, yeah. for predictability. This stuff that's in common is is partitioned out on the side right. because it can't be attributed to either trial individually. So because because there's so little data, so so little time there. If there's a you know a large you know, even a medium change in the data value, it, the, the entire beta gets glommed onto that little tiny chunk. Right. If that makes sense verbally. Uh, yeah. I think that's why it doesn't happen when we do the whole sequence, because that, that, that doesn't occur in reason for regular accounts. Yeah. Yeah, if you guys don't mind, I'd like to see some of what you're dealing with, just to get a sense, because I haven't had that much of an issue with massive trial by trial variability. Again, like if I, I've seen a subject here or there in a typical analysis where they're just off the charts, and then I just exclude them sometimes, because I'm like, what's some, like their data looks fine in all the pre-processing, but for whatever reason, some of the estimates get really Wiggy, and I don't know why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'm talking like one out of like 30 people, sometimes. Um, yeah. <coughs> yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. We've seen like either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, guys, I was trying to <clears throat> keep it a little bit short because my voice obviously is not uh, really up to it today. And also, um, I felt like a lot of this was review in terms of you know, like concepts. Uh, again, these scripts will be uh, up on the website. It's really uh, as simple as just replacing sometimes with sometimes I am. And then if you know the logic about extracting the ROI is creating a, a correlation map, that's really all there is to it. Um, <clears throat> two weeks from today, so two Thursdays from today, uh, I'm going to be out of town. So what I was thinking, uh, originally I was going to do this, uh, this overlap technique that I, I mentioned last time. Um, <laughs> I might save that for the next semester. What we could, yeah, what we can, <laughs> why is that funny? What we could do next week, um, if anybody has any questions about what we did so far, or if you guys have used any of these for your data sets, or if you just have like other AFI questions in general, I say we hold like another hour meeting and hash some of this stuff out. How does that sound? And I, I won't really prepare a lecture, it'll be more like a seminar. That sound good? And uh, the v I know that um, you guys have also had some questions about um, like running a few of these things, right? So <coughs> we could definitely meet before then sometime early next week and, uh, about whatever questions you have. All right. Okay. That's great. Thanks. Okay. Well, we'll break for today. Thanks for coming. Thanks for your attention. Let me stop this recording.